If you're a TED Talk person, you've probably uh, seen or listened to Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Uh, she's a renowned pediatrician and a frequent speaker on this uh, subject. Uh, Dr. Burke Harris is the founder and CEO of the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco, where she works to prevent, screen, and heal exposure to adverse childhood experiences. I started noticing a disturbing trend, right? So the first sign was a, a glut of ADHD patients or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I was being sent patients from uh, principals and uh, teachers and after school programs and counselors saying, please, Dr. Burke, this is before I was married, um, you know, can you please take care of Jimmy? He's got ADHD, he's falling out in class, he won't sit still, it seems like he can't learn. Please, he's got ADHD, can you put him on some Ritalin? And when I said, sure, come on down, and you know, send him on down, I'll see him. But when I actually did a thorough history and physical, what I found was that for most of my patients, um, the diagnosis wasn't that clear. And uh, because most of my patients uh, had tremendous histories of adversity. These were kids who were witnessing domestic violence at home, or kids who had a parent who was experiencing mental illness, severe depression, untreated psychiatric disorders, um, or whose parents uh, were alcoholic or had other substance dependence issues. But then I started noticing again, just uh, strange things happening, like uh, kids were coming in, they had rashes, their hair was falling out. I remember one patient uh, that I had asthma and I was trying to figure out, you know, uh, why this girl's asthma was so bad. We had treated her with all kinds of medications. And as I sat down with mom to talk about her asthma triggers, right? Is it, is it pet dander? Is it pollen? Do you have dust mites in your house? Do you have the anti-allergy covers on your uh, mattress and, and pillowcases? And I asked, what could possibly be triggering your daughter's asthma? And this mom said to me, you know, doctora, I notice that my child's asthma tends to get worse every time her dad punches a hole in the wall. So that led me to dive into the research and the science about how early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of kids. And that is how I came across the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Now, um, I know from our poll that most of you all are familiar with a study that was done by the CDC and Kaiser. And uh, together the researchers asked 17 and a half thousand adults, and this is like the first thing that struck me, right? Because this wasn't a hundred people, or two hundred people, or even a thousand people. This was seventeen and a half thousand adults at Kaiser San Diego, seventy percent Caucasian, seventy percent college educated, and frankly, all with great health care because they were all members of Kaiser. So this wasn't an uninsured, underserved, low-income population. This was middle-class Kaiser San Diego. And uh, what the researchers did was they asked about 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. And those include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mental, mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. These were all of the things that I was seeing in my patients in a very low-income, underserved neighborhood of San Francisco. So I was very interested to see the outcome of this study. And what they found, the first thing that they found was that ACEs, right, adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, are incredibly common. Uh, in California, we looked at our data across race and ethnicity, and we found that actually, when it comes to the traditional 10 criteria, that the rates are actually quite similar across race and ethnicity. In California, the community with the um, highest rates of um, 
ACEs was the Hispanic or Latino uh, community, but it was very, very similar prevalence across all racial and ethnic groups. And when looking at income, what we found also in our California data was that although, um, uh, actually this was not the California data, this was the multi-state data. In the multi-state data, what they found was that in, uh, for individuals across so, uh, income groups, for folks who are earning $50,000 a year or more, their prevalence looked very similar to the, f the presence, prevalence that we saw in uh, the original ACE study, right? 13.2% of individuals had four or more ACEs. But for low-income groups, that number doubled. It was 27.6% with four or more ACEs. So we see that although ACEs are prevalent in all income groups, right, the severity, the burden is greater in lower-income communities. And what burns me up about this is that people don't know. People don't know that they are at greater risk for heart disease or cancer. People don't know that they are at greater risk for developing diabetes or COPD. I think for most of us, when we think about the impacts of early childhood adversity, right? We think, oh, okay, well, I get it that you may be more likely to be depressed or you may be more likely to engage in, um, you know, some kind of health damaging behavior. And initially, right, the researchers looked at this data and they thought, okay, well, this, this kind of makes sense. There's a little bit of common wisdom about this. You have, you know, a rough childhood and you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all those things that are going to ruin your health, right? So really this is a behavioral issue. And they're partially right. And I'm going to put an asterisk around that, right? So what we find is that if you have, uh, your, your risk of being a smoker uh, goes up dramatically with your number of ACEs, right? The, the more ACEs you have, the more likely you are to smoke, the more likely you are to become an alcoholic, the more likely you are to uh, have a teen pregnancy, right? Um, and when we look at uh, early intercourse, teen pregnancy and teen paternity, right, we see in all those cases, the risk increases with ACE score. And so many folks really thought, okay, this is just bad behavior. And this is why it's important for us to understand the science, because we're gonna dive into this um, a, little bit more, a little bit more carefully to unpack that and figure out what that little asterisk was all about. So for me, as a pediatrician caring for patients, right? In order to be able to solve this problem for my patients, in order to be able to improve my patients' health outcomes, I need to understand the mechanism. I need to understand how early adversity leads to all of these poor health outcomes so that I can use that science for prevention and treatment. Understanding the mechanism of what's going on is critically important to making sure that our patients have better outcomes. So how does this happen? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see this guy, right? What happens? What happens in our bodies? Right? Immediately, your amygdala, that little alarm in your brain that tells you when something scary is happening, sends a signal and it activates your hypothalamus, which sends a signal to your pituitary gland sends a signal to our kidneys, uh, our um, adrenals that sit here on top of our kidneys, right? And it says, release stress hormones, right? So you get adrenaline, you get cortisol, right? These are our body's stress hormones. And what do they do, right? They, they fire up your heart so your heart starts to pound, right? It, uh, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you shunt blood, right, to your major skeletal muscles, so you are, you know, strong, you can run, you can jump, away from that tiny muscle that holds your bladder closed, so you might pee your pants, right? <laughs> and, uh, and you're ready to either fight the bear or run from the bear. And this is what is called our fight or flight response. Now, the second thing that happens when your fight or flight response goes off is that uh, if you were to think about it, right, 
Fighting a bear may seem like a bad idea. He's got big teeth. He's got huge claws. Right? Grizzly bears can weigh up to 1,700 pounds. And so that's why your amygdala sends projections to your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's responsible for executive functioning, impulse control, and judgment, and turns it way, way down. And instead, it turns up the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus, or as I like to call it, it's the part of the brain responsible for, I don't know karate, but I do know karate, right? <laughs> This is the within the brain stress response center, and it's responsible for getting you amped up, right? So we're in Boston. Picture New England Patriots fans after a game, right? That's the locus ceruleus. Now the other less obvious thing that happens when you activate your fight or flight response is that it also activates your immune system. Right? Because if that bear gets his claws into you, you want your body to be primed to bring inflammation to stabilize that wound so that you can fight long enough to beat the bear or get away. It is this unbelievably elegantly designed system, right, that is designed to save our lives from a mortal threat. But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. So we now know based off of the last 20 years of research of what happens in a child's body when they're exposed to high doses of adversity. And what's critically important about this is that number one, children are especially sensitive to this repeated activation of the stress response because their brains and bodies are just developing, right? So little kids, uh, and the younger they are, the, the higher risk they, they're at, um, their brains and bodies are still development, developing. Their, their immune system, their hormonal systems, and their neurologic circuits are all in the process of becoming wired, right? And, you know, back in the day, us scientists, we used to, we used to ask the question, is it nature or is it nurture, right? Is it your DNA, is it your genome, or is it your environment? And what we now know, right, that, that question has been put to, to bed for good. We know the answer. The answer is, it is both. They are inextricably intertwined. Your environment determines how your genome is read and transcribed, right? It is both your genetic code and your environment writes something that is called your epigenetic code. It is uh, markers based on your environment your, your body puts markers on your DNA to determine which parts of your DNA will be read and transcribed and which ones won't be. And when children grow up in environments of high stress, those high levels of stress hormones mark our DNA that wires the body to be more stress reactive, right? And as a result, what we see is that when children experience early life adversity, right, without adequate protective factors, and that's a really important piece. Um, we see long-term changes to the brain, structure and function, to the immune system, and to our hormonal systems. And ultimately, these changes are actually, uh, can be seen, detected, at the epigenetic level, the level at which our DNA is read and transcribed. And that is what leads to the hormonal, metabolic, reproductive, neurologic, psychiatric, behavioral, immune, inflammatory, and cardiovascular, right? All of these outcomes uh, that we see uh, in kids as a result, uh, uh, throughout the life course, actually, right? We see these, um, these changes uh, both in childhood and in adulthood. And what we almost missed was the good news, right? And the good news is that if our kids, our low-income black and brown kids at Bayview Hunters Point, if they had no ACEs, 
97% of them were doing fine in school. Across the United States, this is not a red issue or a, a blue issue. This is an American issue, and adverse childhood experiences are threatening American children. Yet, ACEs continue to be a public health crisis that is hidden in plain sight. This data tells me that it's not just in low-income families, right? Everything that we see shows that this is happening in all communities, every socioeconomic status, every ethnic group. And the good news is that the science tells us that we can mitigate the impact of ACEs with early intervention. So how do we do that? We need to do that by raising awareness, uh, by doing early detection, and for us, uh, I strongly advocate that every pediatrician in America should be screening for adverse childhood experiences as part of the regular well-child exam, right? We ask kids, how much milk are you drinking? Is there any lead in your house? We need to be asking about adverse childhood experiences. And then we need to reduce the dose of adversity and enhance the capacity of a caregiver to be a buffer. Listen, stress has been going on since God was a child, right? <laughs> and. Well, we understand we're not trying to eliminate all stress. That's ridiculous. But what the science is telling us is that the, the presence of a buffering adult caregiver makes the difference about whether this tips over into toxic stress, which harms a child's developing brain and body. Right. So the two parts of the solution are reducing, number one, early detection, but then reducing the dose of adversity a child is experiencing and enhancing the ability of the caregiver to be a buffer. And then we also need a lot more research. I honestly cannot think of a more important audience for me to be speaking to than you all, because you all really uh, create uh, the policy environment in which we all work to be able to develop solutions for uh, this public health crisis that is adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress.